Now, this next story blends or may blend the prison industrial complex and the military industrial complex into one big complex question mark. How is it that prison labor is being used to make Patriot missiles for big defense companies such as Lockheed Martin and Boeing? getting paid nothing or nearly nothing to do the work and at the same time undercutting wages for everyone else in the country or some people in the country at least or so argues labor journalist Mike Elk he's here in the studio now so first Mike do you think that anybody would ever think that in the United States uh, someone would make 23 cents an hour that that was possible yeah I mean it's uh, it's a sad situation but you have you know nearly one out of every 100 adults in prison and prison labor, you know, the, the amendments about slavery don't apply to prison labor. You can pay prison labor just about anything you want. In some states, you're supposed to pay at the prevailing wage, but in a lot of other states, you can pay prison labor as much as 23 cents an hour. And most of the defense material, you know, all those faulty uh, body armor that the soldiers had in Iraq was all made by prison labor. Uh, almost all of, you know, bulletproof vests are made by prison labor. All the electronic component and uh, Patriot missiles are almost all made by, uh, the, the wiring is almost all made by prison labor. So then what's new here? Because we've, you know, always heard of prison laborers making license plates or making things that, um, you know, not Patriot missiles perhaps, but you said this has been going on. So what's really new and concerning? I mean, to me what jumps out is how is this, you know, how are these laborers, these slave wages being paid to people that are producing uh, weapons for private corporations, for huge multinational corporations? Yeah, well, I mean, they're government contracts, so it's, they're allowed to do that. Since so that's why, because they're contracts. specific yeah. government contracts. Yeah, although in some states, uh, now there can be made some goods that can be sold in the private market as well. You know, like you have Hanes Furniture in Florida making chairs with prisoners making 23 cents an hour, and they're sold at you know, a variety of different stores throughout Florida. So how is that legal? How does that work? Well, I mean, it's, it's quite complex, actually. Um, there's a number of different laws being passed, you know, that have been passed throughout the United States that you're supposed to pay prison labor the prevailing wage, uh, but in a lot of places there's not good oversight, so they aren't paid the prevailing wage. Uh, they never actually get the wage. What happens is, and a big reason why prison labor is expanding, is that there are two things that never get cut when we talk about cutting deficits. The defense budget and the prison budget. Both have, you know, grown hugely over the last 30 years, and even now we aren't talking about cutting them. And so, how do you finance um, prisons and the defense budget? So the obvious answer is you use prisons to help to finance the defense budget. So they pay the, the prisoners you know, like 20 cents an hour, and then the state gets some of the money as well from the private corporations. And the contractor saves money because they don't have to pay as much. So that's how you keep expanding the two, is you try to use the two. So more and more, we're going to be see prison labor being used as states have a tough time paying for these Well, prisons. yeah, I mean, we see states, too, going broke, and prisons, you know, cost them about $60 billion a year. So this could help defray the cost, too, of keeping people in prison. So in that regard, it could help some of these states that are broke. That is a good thing. Not if it means that states try to keep more people in prison, because what winds up happening is companies like having really cheap labor. And if you have so many people in prison, and companies like having those people in prison because they can pay them next to nothing, then that gives just another incentive to keep more and more people in prison. So as that grows, as this industry grows, do you see people uh, from prison lobbies lobbying Congress harder for tougher crime laws and for things like that? Do you see it having that kind of an insidious role? Yeah. I mean, certainly look at what we know about what happened in Arizona with the anti-immigrant bills there. What happened there was that the private prison corporations lobbied for those bills. Illegal immigration had gone down by two-thirds in Arizona, but they lobbied for those bills because if you lock up immigrants, then you have more people in prison. Right. So we're seeing more and more laws like this. That's a good example. And speaking, I want to bring that up because speaking of Arizona, they passed a law uh, where they included legislation to finish their border fence, and they had a website to get donations and that to finance that, and they said that they're going to be using prison labor to help defray the costs. I mean, I guess it would be, a, <laughs> if they're looking for a low-cost way to do it, I guess it would bring some political problems if they brought the other people that work for subminimum wage, which would be undocumented workers that they're building a fence against, uh, what do you think of, of them using prison labor for this purpose? I think it's something we're seeing expand everywhere throughout the United States, the, the use of prison labor. We have 2.7 million people in prison. That's one out of every 100 adults. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a huge workforce, and corporations really want to tap into it. And the big incentive, it's actually quite ironic, because I've, I've read some of the transcripts of some of these conferences, is that, you know, these people encouraging prison labor, 
will say, well, you know, doing business in China is so complicated. You know, even though they pay so little, you know, it's so much easier if we just make it here in the United States and then, you know, we, we have it in the supply chain. So this is actually the problem is now that the wages are getting so high in China that they want to bring it back here. Are prisons going to be the next China? I think prisons are China's worst nightmare. I think prison labor is the only thing that could really give China a run for its money. Uh, Lockheed Martin, quickly, they're um, eliminating 6,500 jobs, they announced, and uh, they've laid off, I guess, more than 10,000 people since former Defense Secretary Robert Gates signaled a slowdown in U.S. defense spending. But do you think that's really why we're seeing these job losses, or do you think that they're getting more use out of the prison labor? I mean, Unicor employs some 20,000 people. Yeah. Well, they're getting more use out of prison labor, but not only that, they're shipping more jobs to China, Lockheed Martin. You know, increasingly, all U.S. defense goods were supposed to be made in the U.S., but now only typically the final product is assembled here and the component parts are made in other countries. So, you know, Lockheed Martin just signed a big deal with, um, with China, and now they're, you know, they're making jet engines in China, as is GE. So we're seeing more and more of those jobs shipped to China. It's not that those jobs are going away or that Lockheed Martin's profits are going down or because of defense cuts. We're just seeing more of that go elsewhere. I want to keep this conversation going for one more minute. Uh, um, how did this go from union to non-union to prison labor, and how does it affect wages of other workers? It's, it's an incredibly adverse effect because, for instance, if you had prison labor, you know, if you had workers, American workers, union workers making defense parts, they're going to be making good salaries, they're going to have pensions, they're going to have benefits. So they live in an area then that, that drives up wages, you know, if one person makes good benefits and good salaries. But if you don't have that kind of job anymore and you only have these people making 23 cents an hour, it, it really drives down the wages. And how, how do private market businesses that don't use prison labor compete with private market businesses that do use? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. But at the same time, one of the benefits is then you have, you know, obviously recidivism is a problem. Uh, prisoners get out of prison, and it's hard for them to get reincorporated into society. And so on the flip side, you're getting a trained, skilled workforce that's coming out of prisons. They can be uh, more contributing members of society, uh, have jobs, have a skill. Yeah, I mean, in, in a theoretical world, but the discrimination against ex-cons coming out of prison is so great that few of them are able to do that. The recidivism rates in this country are quite high. I think the real solution is not putting so many people in prison in the first place. Well, I mean, there's your solution. I just want to show what some of the uh, other things that, that prison labor is making, just so that people kind of have a sense. Uh, it's not just Patriot missiles. It's riot helmets. It's fingerprint kits, it's loudspeakers, it's salt fog chambers, it's plastic forks and cups, it's floodlights. So it's a lot of different things. Those are all made by Unicor, which employs some 20,000 prisoners at very low wages. So uh, it's really a lot. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's a great amount of stuff. I mean, no Braille books are made in this country that aren't made by prison labor. Well, that's not such a bad thing. I think if you're blind, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a real book expert. That's not my area of expertise. But, uh, you know, it's an incredible amount of goods we're being seen made by people that make just about nothing. All right. Well, I mean, it's certainly a problem that has so many, uh, so much multifaceted impact on the country. And well, it sounds like you think it's just on the up and up. But thank you so much for, for giving us a scoop on that. That was labor journalist Mike Elf.